Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about exits um, in buildings. So we'll look at um, some examples of common exits. Uh, we'll look at uh, the quantity of exits required from a floor area, um, and if you know if you have more than one, um, where they're going to be located, basically in the floor area. Uh, we'll get into how to calculate the width of exits and we'll probably dive into um, some design parameters or at least a high level of uh, section 3446 which will give some design parameters for um, for exits so where we want to go for this is volume one division b part three and section 3.4 is for exits so right away when we go here you know if you just read the scope for exits exit facilities complying with this section shall be provided from every floor area that is intended for occupancy. So basically, if you go to the definition of floor area, um, I won't go there, but it, it'll tell you basically it's every story. So every floor is going to have to have um, exits provided from them. The 3412 separation of exits, um, you know, it gets into, um, generally speaking, when you, t when you think of exits, uh, they're separate from each other in most cases. Okay, so you have one set of stairs on one side of a building, another set of stairs on the other side of the building, and they they never really converge. But there are some allowances for that. So if you had more than two exits, for example, uh, if you had three or four or whatever, um, there is some allowance to converge um, some of them. But there's there's a cap to um, the cumulative capacity of those converging exits. So you know you, you wouldn't use that very often, but there is there is some allowance there basically. So I'm just going to zoom ahead to 342, which is the number and location of exits from floor areas. And so here, uh, the first sentence pretty much for under minimum number of exits will tell you that every floor area intended for occupancy shall be served by at least two exits. So, you know, right off the bat, they're saying you need to have two exits out of a floor area. Why? Well, that would be because, you know, if, if you need to get out of the building in an emergency, what if there's a fire between you and one of those exits? You want to have that second option, basically. It's kind of the idea there. But that said, if you read um, sentence two here, it says, well, you know what? If your building's small enough and you don't have too many people in it, um, then maybe you can get away with one exit. So you just read through that section and make sure that your occupant load is not too much, your travel distance is not too much. Uh, whether you're sprinklered or not sprinklered, you would look at the um, the size of the floor area and the travel distance in that floor area to an exit and so on and so forth so there is some allowance to have one exit in some cases but in in most cases i would say that probably you're going to end up with at least two exits uh, the section on mezzanines is kind of its own beast so I'll, i'm going to skip that for now and probably do a different uh, video on that uh, we'll, we'll go ahead here to three four two three uh, distance between exits so um, i do have another video for this but basically what this is telling you um, at least I have a video for, for I think, looking at um, sentence one, I think it is, A and B. But what this is telling you is, um, you know, if you got to have two exits in a building, they obviously need to be um, a certain distance apart um, to make them useful, I guess, in an emergency. So these parameters in these sentences here basically um, look at the situation of your of your floor area, whether it has a public corridor or not is a big part of it. And then you, you use the diagonal dimension um, of the floor area to start to determine how far apart your exits need to be. So again, there's another video on that, but that kind of high level is they got to be a certain distance apart. And that's what that article is all about. So there's usually not a coincidence that exits from a floor area a lot of the times end up on, on very opposite ends of the building. Um, there's, there's good reason for that. And the code will lead to that, that um, you know, through many, many sentences and articles it'll lead to that outcome basically under 3424 we get into travel distance so th this is starting to set the um the limit to how far you can be from at least one exit in a floor area basically so from any point in a building you need to be within a certain distance um to to an exit and and really this ties in right to the next section here where it starts to give um, in location of, of exits, it, it talks about travel. This is kind of defining travel, what travel distance is, and then down here it gets into what are these maximum travel distances that we can we can have in our 
in our buildings, basically. Um, before I go there, though, the, the sentence two is, is kind of interesting. And so what sentence two is basically saying without reading it here is if we had a, a floor area like so, and let's just say again, we have, you know, an exit stair on this side and an exit stair on that side, and there's no corridor. So this entire floor is one office suite or something like that. Um, you know, so there, there might be, um, you know, offices along the perimeter or whatever. Um, basically, when you're figuring out your travel distance, which will be in the next article, what that distance is. But if you were sitting in this office right here, you, you know, and, and maybe the door is over in this corner, you'd have to make sure that you can get to that exit within a certain distance from the farthest point in the floor. You got to be within a certain distance to at least one exit. Um, and, and so it would be from anywhere in that floor plate, basically. And so that would be the path of, um, of measurement right there. But you got to remember, like, there could be cubicles and corridors and other offices and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's really the path of travel that, that you would have to take to, you know, get around things to get to that exit. And now in sentence two, what it's saying is, well, what if, or not, not what if, but it's saying if you have a if you have a corridor here, a public corridor, with say multiple suites or whatever on this floor, um, that travel distance can actually be measured now. Let's just put in, I'll put in a door here. Put in a couple. I'll put in a couple of doors to some suites, just wherever. Doesn't matter. Let's just say we have a door to a suite there, and we got some doors to suites here, whatever. It, what Article 2 is telling you is that, okay, well, to measure that maximum travel distance, you can now take that from the, the egress point. That's the path you could, you could measure so long as those walls meet certain requirements. And so what this does basically is just, you know, there, there's an extra level of, um, of protection there with the public corridor. And so, yeah, you can just measure your travel distance from the egress door of a suite. And that's pretty much what uh, sentence two is, is, is saying there, if you read through that one. Then we'll move along to the location of exits. So this one here, you know, this is based on uh, what type of building you have, uh, what the uses are in it, um, if it's sprinklered or not, and this type of stuff. So then it'll start to lay out um, some of the maximum um, travel distances you could have. So for example, if you had a storage garage, so a parkade, um, you would have to be able to get to uh, to an exit within 60 meters. So from the farthest point in that parkade to any exit could not exceed 60 meters, for example. Uh, so the most commonly used ones, you know, for your typical everyday buildings are either going to be um, your office buildings that are not sprinklered would be the 40 meters, or if um, Pretty much sentence C is used probably the most if you're sprinklered and almost occupancies, all of them basically, except for the high hazard industrial, you're 45 meters. So you get an extra five meters of distance by being sprinklered. So if you had a sprinklered office building, business and personal services, for example, you wouldn't have to do 40, you could do 45. You just gain an extra five meters there. But if you weren't sprinklered, you'd be 40, for example. This 105 one here in D is, is, is really um, probably used the most in maybe malls. Um, so basically, you know, when, when you're in a mall, it's a pretty big number. So 105 meters to go from somewhere in that floor area um, to an exit, basically, which in a one, say a one story mall would probably just be your exterior door um, somewhere. So uh, in, in this case here, you know, there's, there's no coincidence that that the public corridor has to be nine meters wide and have a ceiling at least four meters high. So if you were to go to a typical mall and measure the, the public corridor in the mall, uh, it'd probably be nine meters wide and the ceiling would probably be at least four meters high. And so anyways, you know, it, it really that's, that you know, that that there's travel distances to be aware of is really the takeaway on that one there that you'd have to review when you're when you're placing your exits in a floor area. Um, you got to be aware of um, of how far away um, you are from an exit, and you know in some cases if you have a really long building, for example, you might have to add that third exit in the middle because otherwise 
the uh, maximum travel distance would be exceeded. So it happens occasionally in your bigger bigger buildings. And now we'll just move ahead to width and height of exits. So um, exit width based on occupant load. So what this is telling you is that you have to figure out your occupant load on a floor, and then you need to um, calculate how wide um, your, your exits need to be based on the, the amount of people in that space. And sentence two talks about if, if, um, if you have two or more exits converging, then um, you, need, you need to um, double the size of basically of a corridor, for example. And maybe I'll draw that one out, except as permitted by 34324. So let's just go there. It need not be cumulative in exit serving two or more floors located one above another. Oh, okay, well, that's interesting. So if you have a high rise building and you have two exit stairs, let's say on each side of the building, um, as you go down the stair, each floor is gonna be contributing more people into that exit. But that sentence there, that 34324, just said that, well, you don't have to make your exit wider. So that's why when you're, if you're in an office tower or something like that, um, the exit stair width, as you go from the top floor down to the bottom floor, it doesn't actually get wider, okay? But in every other case, it does. So in a horizontal case, which I think I'll draw, um, it, it would get wider. And so I'm trying to think of a good example of this. Let's just say you had a situation like this where you have a door leaving this building over in this corner. And in the back here, you've got a corridor like this, let's say. Okay, so there's a tenant here, and a tenant here, and a tenant here. And now, um, you know, the, these tenants would have, say, their own doors that way to the exterior in this case, but they're also going to have doors into this back corridor, potentially. Okay, so typically you do two exits. Um, so, you know, in that case, you, how you actually do this, uh, maybe we'll get into this more, but if you had 100 people here, um, you pretty much assume that 50 are going that way and 50 are going that way. If you had 100 people in here, 50 are going that way, 50 are going that way. And if you had 100 people here, 50 are going that way, and 50 are going that way. And so what that is saying is when you figure out your, your um, exit width based on occupant load, in this situation, it would be cumulative. So you would say, okay, well, I've got 50 people leaving right here, and you'd calculate the width of that corridor. But once you reached the door of this suite, you got another 50 people in there. So all of a sudden, this corridor might get a little bit wider at that point. Okay, so it might get a little bit wider. Then you reach that third door and then maybe it even gets wider. Okay, so as, as more people enter that corridor, uh, the corridor gets wider basically. You'd have to increase the width at, at those points where uh, more people enter it. So that's that's what that sentence is saying. But again, in the vertical situation, that doesn't apply. Okay, and so moving along to 3432, the exit width. So, um, you know, you have to read through all the sentences here but find your find your case. But basically, you know, for most, for most of them, I'd say like uh, a lot of them here, um, for doorways, corridors, you know, your most common situations, you take the occupant load and you multiply it by 6.1. Okay, so very similar to the egress door situation. If you're doing stairs, so your exit or stairs in a second floor, um, your stairs would have to meet these requirements of, um, of the rise and run, basically, to be the exit stair. But you would use a calculation of 8 millimeters instead of 6.1, for example, and so on and so forth. So very similar to egress, you just multiply that occupant load by the, um, by the, by the, value given here basically to figure out the required width. The next important item to note in this one here is number seven. So if more than one exit is required, which typically they are, you usually have more than one, every exit shall be considered as contributing not more than one half the required exit width. So, you know, if we go back to that drawing that I was just doing, which is a bloody mess, obviously, but that's why I was saying, well, if you have an exit on the front side, and an exit on the back side. If you got 100 people, 50 are going that way, and 50 are going that way. That's where that came from. So you had, you know, that that article there is telling you that um, each exit 
shall be considered as contributing not more than one half the required exit width. So you just divide the the you know your occupant load in half and then multiply it by that 6.1 or what have you, and then figure out the width of your of your um, door or corridor or whatever. And of course, you know, like sometimes your occupant loads are really quite low, so there's always going to be minimums. So for example, if we go back to here and we said, well, okay, we got 50 people. Um, we got 50 people heading out this door right here. So you multiply that 50 by 6.1 and you're only going to get a 305 millimeter wide door requirement. So obviously you wouldn't do that. Um, so there's the minimums and you just have to find your, um, your situation, you know, what groups you are. Um, and basically just go with the minimum in that case okay so for a doorway the minimum in, in that case would be um 800 millimeters if it's a group e or group d or something like that uh, you know typically you wouldn't do an 800 millimeter door that's just a minimum but um you know normally you'd have a 900 door but then that single door leaf would satisfy the requirement in that case and then we'll move on to exit width reduction so basically you know generally speaking once you've determined a uh, required exit width, um, you can't have things that, that block that width, basically. However, there are some exceptions to that, okay? So um, swinging doors and the swing shall not reduce the required width of exit stairs. So if it's a stair situation um, or landings to less than 750, for example. And so what does that look like? So if you had a stair like this, let's say, so, you know, maybe you go, oops, maybe you go down this way and you go up that way and you pop a door in here right there let's say okay on the landing um the, that 750 what, what it's basically saying in that case is you know as someone comes comes down from above and keeps working their way down that door swing can't reduce that width to less than 750 basically so there is some allowance there for an example uh sentence three would be a situation where um Maybe in a horizontal exit would be a good one to show here. So you've got an exit corridor here where people are running down, say that way. Um, and maybe you have a couple of doors. <laughs> that wasn't drawn very good. Maybe you have a couple of doors like this. Um, that door there can't reduce the width of the, um, of the required width of this, basically, of that corridor width. So, you know, that's why you see if you go down back corridors of, of spaces, um you know you'll, you'll often see the recess like that and then the doors are like that for example if there's two tenants um, and, and the whole point of that is to um, ensure that the, the door when it's open it's not reducing the width of that corridor for the other people heading down there basically the required width anyways so that's good practice to recess your door like that anyways so people aren't running into the door even if you have your required width and then that last sentence there is just saying like uh, handrails and, and things like that are allowed to project in there a little bit basically uh, and then um, headroom clearance so you know there's just basically headroom height requirements um, pretty straightforward um, you know when you have an exit you can't be crawling <laughs> you can't be crawling down the exit you gotta you gotta have a certain amount of uh, headroom clearance basically Okay, so moving along to 344, the fire separation of exits. Uh, this is this is pretty straightforward. Um, so once um, you determine your construction requirements for your building, um, you know it'll often it'll often say, um, you know, you need a one hour floor or two hour floor or what have you. Um, so once you get through that process, then you can figure out the fire resistance rating of your exits, because it pretty much just tells you that. Um, Whatever that rating is required from section 322, that's where you find out all those requirements for your building. Whatever your um, your fire separation and FRR is, um, use that number basically for your exit is essentially what it is. So if you had a, a one hour rated floor, uh, you would need a one hour fire rating around the stair, for example, or if it was an exit corridor down around the corridor. Um, if you had a two hour floor, then you'd need that two hour wall around the stairs or around some exit corridor. And then it just goes on to say it caps it off at two hours, so you don't need more than two hours basically. 
it I'll draw out some, you know, at the end of this video here, I'll, I'll draw out some scenarios of your common, you know, exit situations, um, just to better understand that. But that's really how you figure out your, your fire separation for your exits. Um, next one here, exits through lobbies. So um, maybe maybe now is a good time to sketch out um, the, uh, the whole idea of an exit. Okay, so I've drawn a floor plate here with a, um, with a scissor stair kind of in the middle of the building ish okay and so the main entry to the building is down here um so this this um exit through lobby so generally speaking whenever you enter an exit actually let's let's just go to a, a, my other typical floor plate first so let's just say we have this typical situation where you know there's, there's an exit stair at each end of a floor for example so um the idea is, so we just looked at an article that says, well, that stair is going to have a, a certain fire rating there, and it's going to be based off of, in most cases, the, the floor fire rating. So fire separation with a fire resistance rating. So um, the whole point of a, um, an exit is, you know, once you leave, say, a suite and get to that stair, once you enter that stair, you're in a safe zone for a certain amount of time. Not that you should stand around and wait for anything, but um, it's basically you've entered now a safe zone. And the idea of a exit stair is that you don't leave that safe zone until you exit the building in most cases, okay? Or get you get you know to that other safe um, space that's that's defined in the definitions, but usually it's to the outdoors. So you can't for so for, so what I'm saying is you can't. Uh, we'll go back to my other example here. You you can't go to um, so here's one, the scissor stair. If you enter the exit stair on the second floor and you come down, okay, so that now this, this stair here is the protected zone. It's got the fire rating of whatever the floor is. And if you exit out of that stair now, but you're not exiting outside, that's not permitted typically, okay? So the idea is once you're in that safe zone, you that a safe zone should extend to the point where you can get to that safety so in this case what that would mean is um you know in the scissor stair scenario so you'd come down the stair and you don't want to enter into the main area of the building again because that's kind of the unsafe zone so <clears throat> what you would do in that case is you would just build a corridor here like that okay and that corridor would then have the same fire rating as basically your your rectangle around the stair and you know and then really you could decide at that point that you don't even you don't even need that door if you don't want but you know the idea is that you come down and you don't you've always got that safety in that zone oops in that zone right there you don't leave it to get outside so that's the concept for an exit so you know when you're looking at an exit it's you don't leave that and enter the dangerous part of the floor again that's on fire um, to get to the safety except for i believe this is the only instance uh, if i remember correctly that i've used before anyways except for one situation where it says okay you can exit through a lobby okay so if you read through this you know there's a whole bunch of requirements to that lobby that lobby has to meet certain requirements but what that's basically saying is okay you can come down one of them and it says in that article can't be for two it's just for one stair and it has to be in a lobby so if we said this was the main entrance of the building right here and so this is the lobby. Um, if you came down this stair, that article there is permitting you to be able to go out like that through the lobby to get the exterior. So, so it's allowing you not to have to do that basically for one of the exits. But again, that lobby has to meet um, a bunch of requirements. One of them being that that distance from um, the distance from the from the door to the from door to door basically can't be more than 15 meters for example otherwise aside from that article um yeah you you don't you, you're in the safe zone when you leave that exit and, and you would approach it um like this situation where you have to basically and then so we'll just jump ahead now to um three four four integrity of exit so this is you know there's a bunch of requirements in there but essentially it's just saying that like obviously once you're in that safe zone the more um, more openings you have into it and, and uses you have of it and penetrations into it, the pipes and ducts and all kinds of stuff, the more stuff you put in there, the less safe it becomes. So this article is just prescribing a bunch of um, uh, limitations to how to keep the integrity of that exit without compromising the integrity of the exit.
you know, so for example, a fuel fired appliance shall not be installed in exit. Well, of course, because a fuel fired appliance might be the thing that catches on fire, right? So there's things like that. Now, there's an interesting one here that, um, you know, I, I guess in the, in the mall retail world, we would use this one a lot. Let me just find it here. Um, service rooms. Service room shall not open directly into an exit. If we just go back to this drawing, what that's saying is if you, if, if, you know, so now in this back entry scenario over here, um, we've pretty much said that this this corridor here now is part of the exit, right? So I don't know what happened to my erasing that there. So, um, oops. and so if you had a, a service room, say here, okay, there's your service room, you couldn't have the door opening directly onto that exit. So a kind of a sneaky way around that is to add a vestibule. Now it's not opening directly onto that exit. So that, that's used quite a bit, but but obviously, you know, you're not trying to sneak around the safety requirements of the code, but um, you know, that'd be a way to avoid opening a service room directly into the exit. So it's not direct anymore, basically. So that was just kind of something I, I saw that was quite common in malls in long you know the long um rear say a rear exit corridor and so anyways there's some important stuff to read there and that's kind of the integrity of exits so now let's just take a look at um the most common scenarios of exits so we've seen a couple already here um let's take a look at um well I don't, that actually covers most of them i would say you know the only other scenario i could think of is maybe to show a main floor, you know, and so if you had a, a strip mall or something like that, or even if it's a multi-story building, I mean, maybe you have a stair coming down somewhere and a small lobby or something like that, you know, maybe some stairs are there and an elevator or whatever. But, you know, for these tenants on the main floor, their exits, like they're not going to use a stair. Their exits are basically their, their main entries and usually some back doors from their space. So those would be their exit points. Um, you know, so there's no there's no fire rate required around those exits because you're exiting directly outside. But for the people coming down from above, obviously, um, that would be the exit there. So generally on the main floor, yeah, you, you're not usually, I'd say, using a corridor, but let's just maybe look at a scenario where you might have a an exit corridor. So a scenario where you might have, say, an exit corridor could be something like this so let's just imagine this is a giant building the doors are a little bit out of proportion but they're big box stores and um you know there's exits out out their fronts or whatever and there's exits out the back okay and now let's just say from the midpoint of this let's just say that ended up that distance there ended up being your 45 meters or whatever your maximum travel distance is and let's just say that was going to be your 45 meters which by the way if you ever have that situation for the middle of the space if it's an empty base building space give yourself some fluff right because once the fixture is going there like shelving and all this kind of stuff um you still got to be able to make sure you make that 45 meters but let's just say that distance there becomes the 45 meters and that's the maximum travel distance so we and for whatever reason we can't put we can't put um, doors out the back of the space so maybe it maybe the grade's really high along this side of the building let's yeah that's a good idea let's just say that the grade's really high along here like that uh, you know obviously you could put a door in and put some stairs in or something like that but let's just say you don't take that approach and that purple line there is your is your 45 meters so what you can do in that case is design oops design this corridor if i can get my colors right here design this corridor to be an exit corridor so fire rate that corridor just like you would a stair and then basically that that um that 45 meters or whatever your distance is is to that point because now you're in that safe zone basically so that's where you might use um a, an exit corridor um you know kind of like a stair but you'd use it as a corridor basically um because if you know again like if if that distance say from there to there was exceeding that 45 meters to that point right there the exterior then you'd have a problem 
and so that's that's commonly done in very very large um very large footprint buildings basically it happens quite a bit i've even seen some instances you know in warehouse buildings where um you know you just got this massive warehouse building you know if we were to draw a door to the to the scale of how big some of these buildings can be you know sometimes you'll get to a point in here and that distance I think it's like 60 meters for that type of use, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If if you're exceeding it, let's just say that would, let's say it was 60, I'd have to check, but let's just say that was um, 80 meters. It's like, oh shoot, I got a problem there. Um, you know, I've seen instances where a corridor could be built like this on the building and it becomes a fire rated corridor. with a door right there so that from a point you know so you don't exceed the travel distance to an exit basically so you know that's that's a little trick of um, design for massive massive buildings envision this one being like a mall okay so you come in a mall and you, you walk in the door and you can do your loop around the mall well there's there's tenants in the middle okay so um, maybe those tenants um, you know, to leave the tenant space, maybe a far one down here, maybe it's beyond that 105 meters or whatever. Okay, so there, there would be a back door from that tenant, and often that back corridor behind all those tenants in the middle will be fire rated as an exit corridor, because, you know, just to get it within that 105 meters situation. Um, although you wouldn't even be able to use 105 in that case, because you have to have that nine meter wide corridor by four meters high. But nonetheless, the point is, where I'm going with this one is, um, you can't, Again, if you if that if that corridor back there is designed behind the spaces is designed as an exit corridor, then once you're in there, you got to get outside. So you can't just um, you can't just leave that space, that protected corridor space. You can't just leave it. Go back into the mall to get out. Say that way. Can't do that. So usually what happens in these cases, there's actually tunnels that take you underground. Okay, and there'll be a tunnel somewhere leading from that back corridor out of the building somewhere else. That's that's common as well. Uh, and, that, and that's just all because of that article saying you can't, once you're in that exit, uh, you, you pretty much, um, you got to get outside. Um, there's no, there's no, it's not an exiting through a lobby situation in that case, let's put it that way. Yeah, those are some those are some examples of exits. Um, so that that kind of gives a pretty good summary of um, of exits.